Hey there, it's your co-host Sid. And this is your co-host Sharfos. We know that job search is a difficult process. It can be frustrating, it's hard to network, find the right fit for yourself, and it can be a very lonely journey. Here at Careers on Court, we're trying to bridge that journey and have amazing conversations with people. And we want to welcome you to our episode today. Hey, Ali. Hey, Sid, what's up? Not too much. I just always get so happy whenever I see Shirfuz do that introduction. It's, it's like, yeah. really like it feels like I'm on a flight and he's like, oh, this direction <laughs> here, this is, this is the emergency <laughs> exit. <laughs> yeah, totally. He's like very professional, poised, excited to be there. He had the yeah. right vibe going totally, on. Totally, totally. Yep. I'm really excited for the session today. So you actually know Min back from high school, I believe. So you want to yeah. give us an introduction about what to expect from the session, first of all? I'm so excited for today's session. Min and I go way back. We were in high school band together, an OG friend, um, and she's out doing amazing things in the world. Um, one of the last times I saw her, I was studying abroad in London, and she posted on Facebook that she was going to be in Paris for two weeks for work. And I was like, hello, please, let's hang out. So I took an overnight bus to see her and spent one day with her. And it was amazing. She's um, such a role model for me and I'm so excited to interview her. Yeah, most definitely. Likewise here, let's bring her on stage and hear from her. Hi, Ali. Hello. Hi, <laughs> All right, let me put you right in the center. There we go. That's way better. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. How are you guys? We're really, really excited to have you. We were just speaking backstage, uh, just for the audience. We were speaking about how excited we were. Ali made a Facebook post, um, which did. is really, really cool. Um, <laughs> but yeah, Min, you want to give us a quick introduction just for the audience uh, about what you do and where you're currently living, because I know you've traveled a lot. Yeah, yeah. I don't advise traveling during these times unless you have to, of course, but I've been playing a bit of hopscotch around the country. So um, as Sid and Alie said, my name is Min. I am currently a consultant with the International Organization for Migration, which is the UN arm uh, working on migration around the world. I'm also a master's student at Sciences Po or the Paris Institute of International um, Affairs in Paris. And I'm calling from outside of Washington, DC. I will soon be in Mexico City and then Paris. Um, don't Mexico travel City. unless you have to. Yeah, we'll update you later. <laughs> <laughs> don't travel unless you have to, folks. But um, it's a pleasure to be calling in regardless. A little bit of backstory. Min has been trying to get a visa to get to school in Paris for so long. She recently got a visa. We're so proud. Um, I'm so glad you're going to be able to be there, even though maybe you won't be able to be in person classes. What's the plan for that? Yeah, um, it's really hard to say. The president recently approved of like a certain quota of in-person classes, but every university okay. is on its own. I don't know, but it would just be nice to not have right. school at 3 a.m. <laughs> right. So we'll see. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's really, really yeah. exciting. Um, I was actually just going to mention um, yesterday, one of our team members reached out and we've sort of been looking for someone with your background. And it's really nice to have so much sort of various uh, guests that we've had with different backgrounds. And I think you're really like completing the circle for us by coming in with this yeah. different perspective. So we're super excited for this. So just to get us started, I just want to do like a brief introduction because we have some viewers tuning in right now. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what projects you're working on? Just give us, fill us in a little bit about what exactly um, is sort of a day-to-day -day look like for you. Sure. So I work in a consultant role. So that's a little bit different from a full-time position. Mm -hmm. um, you might, some people might be interested in a consultant role as they come out of college. The nice part is it's flexible, but your hours and pay aren't guaranteed. So there are drawbacks. We can talk about that mm -hmm. later. But what I help out with is the reporting, which sounds a bit um, boring, but maybe I'll explain why it works for me. So every time there is foreign assistance given in any form, donors or the people or the country or the agency that gives it wants to know if it worked, how well it worked, how to improve. And that's where the reporting comes in. And so I help streamline um, that process with copy editing and just overall um, assistance to the people that write it. And for me, it's perfect. Um, it has the flexibility I need to do it, especially being 
a master student. Mm -hmm. And I think it also just gives a good idea as to where the organization is going. It's a big bird's eye view type role. I think with anyone who's worked for a little bit, you can get a little, you know, day in, day out and not really understand where it's going. But when you look at something like reporting, if the aid is working in the way you want it to, where did it go? What did it do? Um, it's really helpful. And it provides, like I said, a bird's eye view. But to others, reporting might seem like the worst part of foreign aid. <laughs> <laughs> and to others, it's the best. So it depends on what you fancy. That's really, really exciting. And so you're currently a, a master's student. You're also a contractor at the UN. So what is it, what, what's life like? Like what's life like outside just of like work? What do you um, do in your free time? Yeah, um, great question. <laughs> I would say I spend a lot of time on the phone with friends, which sounds a bit odd. Um, we were cracking some Gen Z versus millennial jokes before. <laughs> But I learned so much from talking to my friends and what they're doing, talking right. with Alie and how she's approaching her creative work. Um, I have another friend that's doing environmental science, the way she sees the world has inspired mm -hmm. me from when I'm taking classes and doing creative projects. Like I did a social network analysis last semester. I didn't focus on anything that I'm technically going to school for. I focused on um, climate change and how the rhetoric was different from UK versus a certain set of countries out of the African continent to see who was more alarmist and how they mm. framed climate change. And just the way they look at problems, just friends that are doing different things. I think that's so valuable. And I get to catch up with them. So that's 80% of my time. <laughs> the other 20, I'm probably hiking, um, painting a lot weirdly I just paint I did not I did wrong direction I did not <laughs> paint that <laughs> um and I'm finding ways to put together everything that I'm learning because I think when you work or you're in school it's a lot of information to process so a good way to make it all stick is to talk with people mm -hmm. and right. to just explore with your explore your creative side and see how you're digesting it all so that's what I'm probably doing that's, that's really interesting. I, we love asking this question, especially because we're in a pandemic right now, just to see how people are spending their times being productive. So this is really, really uh, great to hear. Definitely. Right, I, I love that you um, focus on the learning. I know that you're in grad school right now, so that's like a big part of what you're doing with your life in like the professional sense. But um, we were talking a, a bit ago about how um, continuing to learn always is so important to us. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why we've stuck together all these years. Um, but that's one of the things that I really admire about you. Um, and on that note, I'd love to hear about a little bit about your undergrad experience. And also, um, I know you've had a lot of different jobs, um, since undergrad, I mentioned your paralegal experience earlier. Um, just if you could like tell us a little bit about your, um, like a Reader's Digest version of what you've done since college and um, in school. Yeah, sure. So I guess I'll start after I graduated high school. I will make that quick. So Ali and I went to school in the Midwest. Um, kind of in a place where you were expected to stay in the tri-state area, and we both right. did not do that. So right. I went to undergrad at Emory University in Atlanta. It was the complete opposite of where I was from, and I loved, I loved it. But it was hard in certain ways that I think are identifiable to a lot of people, and mm -hmm. in other ways are just unique to who you are. So for me, I was coming in um, low income and first gen to a point. My parents are immigrants. I'm generation mm -hmm. 1.5. They have degrees, but they had no idea what it took to get into university here, much right. less with a scholarship. Um, there was a study that came out years ago. The stats are outdated, but at least in 2013, the acceptance rate for Harvard was at approximately 5%. And then for a low income student to get into a school with full, like a full ride was about the same amount, if not less. So I walked into Emory thinking, I had to make the most of it. I'm part of the people that um, was very lucky and didn't right. always, you know, I never dreamed I was there. And 
I wanted to save the world and make money. So naturally I thought pre-med. And so I was a chemistry major, Arabic minor. I quickly learned for a lot of reasons it wasn't for me. And it was really hard to give that up because I thought just the pathos and the ethos of the medical field was everything that I wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually got a bit far, like farther down the line, had mentors in the medical field. And it just, I couldn't make it stick. And we can talk about that later if you want. Mm -hmm. Um, when I reevaluated, I realized I wanted to do an IR. I had no background in it. Our school didn't really have a robust social studies curriculum, but I kept working at it. And I think that's the biggest Mm -hmm. tip I can give you. Remember Mm -hmm. getting a subpar grade on my first IR essay. And the reason when I asked was you, the teacher said, or the TA said, you just didn't write political science enough. (laughs) <laughs> which sounds subjective right and so but you can go one of two ways you can argue and there's a time for both but I said fine okay so I read everything to write quote-unquote political science mm-hmm. so um uphill battle but by the time I graduated I made it but was very um like most people confused as to why I was being forced out of this ecosystem that I figured out, especially as someone who walked in very different from the average person that attends such a university. Mm -hmm. But I left, um, I had an internship that was life changing, but then I was unemployed. And then I took the first job that came to me, which was litigation. Um, I did not want to do law, but I fell into it. There are upsides, of course, and downsides of getting a job that you didn't expect or you don't want. But I can tell you in the long term, it does pay off. You just have to find a way to make meaning of it and to keep your creative streak. So to anyone that's just graduating, I know it feels like you (laughs) didn't meet yourself somewhere, but I promise you that's not true. You can find a way through Mm -hmm. it. I did. So after Mm -hmm. law, I got a job in development. I worked. I was in programs. Um, focusing on development programs in the Middle East and North Africa. My boss was great, and I had a want for research, so I also did part-time research. You see where this is going. Mm -hmm. Then I ended up being a research consultant, and then I went to grad school, and I still do research. Well, not consultancies, but not for research anymore, but on the reporting side. So, you know, make meaning as you will throughout all your jobs. Maybe it's not in your job description, but there's a way to get there. And more than that, I'm not in development anymore. I'm in humanitarian aid. So that's different. So there's a way through it. Yeah, definitely. I, one of the things I heard recently that's been really sticking with me is um, finding a job or having a job that you don't love is actually more powerful than having a job that you do love because it allows you to decide what you don't want to do. And for me, um, communications is such a big field. So post-grad, I was like, what do I do? Like, what what is there for, there's so many things for me to do. How do I pick, basically? Um, so I completely agree. And that's true of my, um, my path as well, where it was like, not sure where I'm going, not sure where I'm going. Aha, you know, it kind of pops up at you, so. I appreciate that, um, that that happened to you, of course, also because I appreciate you. Um, (laughs) But I, I'm curious, what was it about humanitarian aid and development that drew you, like, where on that path did you decide about humanitarian, humanitarian aid and kind of a little, tell us a little bit about that navigation yeah well I'll say your career is just like much of life is fluid so just because I'm right. in humanitarian aid now doesn't mean I might not go back to development or we work in these silos if you go to the exactly. academia or even the policy they'll say we need more coordination so right. um, to all you out there if you start at something else it's not a problem right. um, I think at a certain point I realized that I liked the pathos and the logic, I could have said logos, but I just liked the overall spirit of humanitarian aid better than Mm -hmm. development aid, or I wanted to explore it. Maybe we don't have to galvanize. We can say that I wanted to explore it. When you work in development in a certain type of development, you might be working at the institutional level, 
and that's actually quite common, but mm -hmm. I wanted to work at the people to people level. I also was raised, um, like, I guess we can talk openly, like my parents are ministers and they were very much of like, everyone should have, you know, unconditional access to rights and basic needs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that's what humanitarian need mm -hmm. is, regardless of who you are or what institution you're a part of. So I think somewhere in the back of my mind, it just clicked better. Um, if not, it caught my intrigue, that's for sure. But how mm -hmm. do you, um, how do you, I don't want to say triage, but how do you do that in a disaster environment? How do you find out right. where these people are? What are they doing? Um, there are limited resources in every crisis, especially now. So how are, how are the, how is the research team coordinating with the logistics team and getting this quote unquote unconditional aid to these people? And those are the things that fascinate me. How do you do it in a conflict zone? Um, how do you do it in a, like anything else really, if there's flooding, it's quite, it sounds quite, um, I guess nuts and boltsy, but right. I think I also liked that part of it too. So mm -hmm. it depends on what sticks for you, but that's what I like. Definitely. Um, yeah, that's amazing. I, it's interesting to hear your perspective because I feel like humanitarian aid is such a big buzzword that nobody really knows what it means. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. That's really, um, that's really special. Um, last question for me for the moment. Um, how did your undergrad experience prepare you for your career? Like how did, I know you've been talking about this like mm -hmm. flow, but, um, what about undergrad, helped you and obviously now you're in your master's so you could speak a little bit to what you're doing now as well yeah boy I haven't thought about like 22 year old me in a really right. long time right I would say that I truly believe in a lot of ways the hardest part is over after you finish undergrad yeah. Some people might disagree with me here, but when it comes to matters of imposter syndrome, especially and if you can do this, how you're going to do it, or this re-breaking and remolding of yourself that occurs, a lot of it happens during undergrad. And if it can, if you can survive it once, you can survive it again. So for me, with the whole um, example of I didn't write social science, <laughs> which is right. true, chemistry was more my thing at the time, um, fine, you can teach me. You know, when you go through an interview, show them, I know I don't have this, but I'm a quick learner. And if you, as my boss, think this is important, I can learn it. Um, mm -hmm. That is so much more sustainable than meeting right. job descriptions. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that my undergrad experience told me is I can really work through anything if I put my mind to it and I know my limits. So if I have to stop, because this is not me, um, I'm not the right person for the job, then I also had those moments right. in undergrad. I can't remember how they manifested, but probably when I was like, I can't do chemistry. This would save right. my life financially, yeah. and maybe this is what I wanted at 18. It's not anymore at 19. So I think that's what I learned, um, was to look back at my former self and be like, good job, and now keep doing that. Um, mm -hmm. If I look at what I did now to my master's, I learned that the world is not so black and white, which is a bit of conventional wisdom, but especially in the times that we live in now, right. um, you learn it's less about sides and more about how you can approach a topic, an issue, a problem, a solution, and make meaning right. of it. Mm -hmm. And it's not very clear what the best answer is or if you want to be moral what the right answer is if you use the black and white lens you obscure like 500 possibilities by doing that I don't think I quite understood that in undergrad of course I would have been like yeah 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 like I understand we shouldn't be doing experience but you really do see it you'll see it in the workplace you'll see it when you come up when you have like life moments that really have no clear answers and you just right. have to wait right. um, and when you just have to talk to people and so when I go back to um, my master's and I ask questions in class unless it's less about what should the answer be and more right. about how should I perceive problems like this 
or mm-hmm. if you have an issue with how foreign aid is distributed and there's I won't go into it but there is a lot of literature on that then um what can we do to work towards the world that we envision instead of the ones we have issues right. with right what you know ask the practitioners ask the academics they spend a lot of time thinking about this I don't think I would have asked that in undergrad it's only after working right. that I've just that I've seen that is the prime opportunity to ask people. Mm -hmm. You start to wonder what are the right questions to ask instead of just asking the questions, you kind of have more of like a, a thought of like, what is, you know, what's the right question to get to the answer? I think you start, you'll, we'll always want answers, (laughs) right? but we'll start to ask about tools instead of mm-hmm. about answers and we'll try to start to see things as they are versus as we want them to be you need both mm-hmm. don't get me wrong but you're more right. patient um you'll understand that the tone that you set in the classroom might enable the professor to be i don't want to say more vulnerable but maybe more open with you mm-hmm. and you don't see it as just a transactional situation right you might get the time to know the professor and holy cow he's looking for a research assistant everything about your learning environment changes at least for me it might not with anyone but it depends on what you recognize or it depends on what you see but you can only see if you can recognize something and you can only recognize something if you were trained in recognizing that right that did not come from me that came from a teacher but then that begs the question of what have i been missing and that is why i talk to people constantly especially friends right always learning (sighs) always learning that's a great, great message, honestly. I think I want to touch back onto one of the things that we previously spoke about. I thought you had a great message there when you said you might not always have the right opportunity right when you graduate, but there's there's use of uh, making that opportunity worth your while. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I really wanted you to sort of delve a little deeper in terms of your career progression, like from your college major, which ended up being international relations, to mm-hmm. sort of changing uh, jobs just to find the right thing for you. How exactly did you know when was the right time to switch? And how did you know that you're gaining the right skills that could be translated into something? You you don't know, you feel. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You feel if you check in, <laughs> if you don't stop the feeling from coming to you. Right. Being in the job that's not quite for you is not always the best feeling, mm-hmm. but and nor do I recommend that you do it just to do it and say, you know, feel this feeling that's not that great. But like anything that is subpar in your life, you can navigate direction. So I worked in corporate mm-hmm. litigation. I had a second phone. If that tells you anything, it tells you something. Um, but I kept on at all times. Now, what could I possibly learn? in corporate litigation, not wanting to do law and having a second phone where it sounds like my life is non-existent. Well, you learn how to work with someone that you've never seen before, which is incredibly helpful during COVID. Mm -hmm. If you ever work with a field team, um, also very incredibly helpful, or just a team that's not in the same time zone as you even. You uh, get very good at communication. You learn how to work with a bunch of people. So I had 17 people do my final review. I asked 25 and 17 people did it, which means I worked in depth with 17 people. So you learn yeah. how to be flexible. Um, I got to the point where I was writing down communication styles because that's how it worked. And that's actually how I excelled at my litigation job, not because I wanted to do law, but because I could level up, level down or across or just pivot to what attorneys needed. The Mm -hmm. other part is there was an opportunity to work on asylum cases. Mm -hmm. Now I'm now pivoting more towards refugee and migration, but for the longest time, I didn't want to do that. And there was a reason why, um, which we can touch on later if anyone has a question. But I think that to me, as much as I wasn't super passionate about corporate law, just showed me the power of law and of itself. Mm-hmm. of what it could do just in general even if you're not a fan of law or if you have you know an axe to grind I understand but it just was more it pulled me back and it appreciated I could appreciate the attorneys and what they were doing mm-hmm. um, what they were trying to do um, 
there's all these newspapers about, you know, X company defends Y person, but then you get to know attorneys and ask them what they're doing when they're not working on this case. And they're trying to defend people getting asylum. They're doing right. things pro bono. They're volunteering. Um, and you just learn how to connect with people that you would think I would never have anything in common with an anti-corruption attorney. Yeah, you can. Um, so I think the focus on anti-corruption is what got me my next job. Not completely. I, to this day, do not know what got me my next job and I won't pretend to, but I was told that the focus on anti-corruption and perhaps transparency overall mm -hmm. spoke to some of the aid programs the organization was working on in terms of um, local transparency, fiscal transparency of local governments to facilitate good governance. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't see that coming. I actually was quite shocked. So that was a lesson to me to never discount your own experiences, even if you feel they couldn't possibly relate. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to think about how to make meaning of those experiences and you're not in the field that you want to, um, talk to someone. Mm -hmm. It might take a few LinkedIn messages, some cold call emails, maybe mm -hmm. they don't respond. But eventually, you will find someone that was in your position that can pull on these threads of your thoughts and say, tell mm -hmm. me more. And they can say, you know what that is? That's proposal development or that is right. um, assisting with project management. Mm -hmm. Again, only seeing things if you can recognize them, you right. learn, you get that from talking to people. So I think that's not exactly how I found my job, but when I did find my job and it took a lot of applications, yeah. I was told that was the link. Um, yeah, so it validated a lot of this long 10 months that I was yeah. at this law <laughs> That's so, so interesting. I mean, honestly, I think that's just such a way, such a great way to approach the situation is finding that common thread where you can build a storyline off of your previous experiences in terms of projecting you for your next role. So that's really, really interesting here. Um, one thing I want to also dig uh, deeper into, you mentioned something about imposter syndrome, which I believe is so, so common with our generation. Um, mm -hmm. I felt the same way when I was first applying for internships uh, back in college. I felt like I just didn't know much. What would I be able to contribute? So how do you sort of get over this this fear almost and sort of structure um, your work ethic and your sort of mental stability around the fact that you are capable? I think it's a bit of tough love, but there's a lot of comfort that can come from tough love. So mm -hmm. the first mm -hmm. question would be, well, where is your imposter syndrome coming from? If it's, I don't think I can do something as well as X person next to me. Mm -hmm. Right. I'd say, yes, you are not the smartest person in the world. Right. <laughs> that, yeah. yes, that, that is mm -hmm. true. Does that make you any less of an applicant, a person, a friend, a daughter, a citizen? It absolutely does not. The worst mm -hmm. thing they can say is say no. Mm -hmm. So, Wherever that arises from, I think there's a tension between confidence and humility there. And it's a bit of a false, it's like a wool and sheep's clothing. At first, mm -hmm. it looks like too much, I don't want to say too humble, but not confident. Mm -hmm. And But if you dig deeper, it usually, or in my experience, comes from doubt. And when you ask mm -hmm. when it's doubt about what, then it's doubt about that I'm not the best person ever. And it said, who, who told you you're the best person ever? I think great people can make great strides. And since when was best your mark? How unhappy mm -hmm. will you be from making that your mark? So I think that's more of a long-term thing, maybe of too much more psychology than people want. But mm -hmm. if you want to survive this imposter game, I advise that you think on it. And it's very personal. Right. So you know, think about it how you want. But in the end, I found a lot of comfort in knowing this, that imposter syndrome doesn't go away. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. Everyone has right. imposter syndrome. Either you think you're an imposter or someone else is. So yeah. the question now is how do we, I don't want to say manage it, but I said I will use the Bogart <laughs> Um, illusion from Harry Potter is basically how do you look at it every day and kind of square it down and put it in a box? Right. And it. Mm -hmm. Not today. Um, 
for me, it was real for me. It was realizing that it was clouding my judgment. It was disable, it was disabling me, literally disabling me. It made me um, more frantic in ways that I'm not a frantic person. That was coming off in interviews. It has it can make certain people combative, not competitive, but combative, right? Because they are insecure and you know, be the energy you want to receive. We don't want that. Mm -hmm. So for the good, for your inner peace and for the peace of others and for the good of the order, I beg you, find a way to put it in the right. closet every morning, whatever you have to do. It, sometimes it just gets the better of us. Um, but you can always learn to put it away for longer. You can ignore it for longer. But I think mm -hmm. there's so much power in recognizing it doesn't go away but I still am a wonderful person. I'm still just as functional as an employee and right. self doubt is not the same thing as lack of confidence. I think the only people, or not the only people, but confidence and humility does have doubt pulled in, but in a way that's not about me, 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 I, 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 I lack right. this. Yeah. Um, this. Yeah, so it's more about how can I advance and how can we, it's more of a we than an I, sounds very stereotypical, but once you start mm -hmm. thinking this way, the imposters just dissipate. They just, you don't right. even listen to them anymore. Yeah. Right. So I think, oh, go ahead, Sid. Oh, no, I was just gonna say, that's a really, really interesting way of thinking about it. I think we were talking a few weeks ago, correct me if I'm wrong, about the shift from like thinking about the world from yourself to thinking about the world collectively, which you were just touching on there, like early 20s post post grad is like, you're trying to figure out how you are in the world. And then over time, you think more about how the world is period. And you're able to kind of like come away from yourself, um, which I think is really powerful to be aware of before you have hit that change in yourself. Um, so yeah, thanks for speaking to that. I know I personally um, really relate. Imposter syndrome hit me hard when I arrived at the U of R. Um, and it just, it's, it was like, yeah, it's, it's shocking and it's interesting that it keeps coming back. You like think you're over it and then you're in a new scenario and you're like, oh, this again. Yeah. How part of it's not being hard on yourself too, right? Because that's the other side of the coin. The more you're like, mm -hmm. why can't I get over this? Why can I not pull it together? It's like we have our ups and downs and we chip away at them one day at a time. That's okay. okay. I think that just gives you more, not just more humility, but also more peace. And you can recognize that when someone else is going through it, maybe you manage someone and you say, hey, it's okay. Yeah. Right. It's fine. Oh, yeah, right. no, look, uh, not to drill too much deeper into uh, the imposter syndrome fact, but <laughs> about, about the thing about being around the right group of people, uh, right. I think that plays a very, very important role as well, like your friend circle, the people you're closest to, uh, to right, make yeah. sure that they support you. Right. I think they say that you become the five people that you spend the most time with, mm -hmm. something like that. So that's I see the similarity really between you two. Oh, huh. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a well, it's a long time we've been. <laughs> <laughs> There's also well sociology has proved that too, right? So I was reading about social network analysis because I'm very sure I want to use that for my thesis and mm -hmm. what that's all about is it's not just who are you. It's um who are you with whom are you? With whom mm -hmm. are you? How do you mm -hmm. behave in a network mm -hmm. and how does your network uh, shape not who are you, but you might evolve differently and you collectively right. evolve. Like a company that right. takes off um, versus the one that does it and they're identical. Right. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, what's different? And it's like, well, who were you surrounded by? And okay. what bonds did you have with people? That's yeah. what social network analysis is looking at. So you, right. who are you as a collective also speak right. to your Definitely. Potential. Right, yeah. entrepreneurship advice with Min Park. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the least creative person I know. So no, 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 no. That's crazy. not even true. You can't say that on live. I <laughs> I just reject that fully. You are not not creative. 
you can't. I'm just gonna cut you off right there. Um, Creative. We, Any UN consultants that are listening. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, we'd love to hear more about specific advice you'd have for people that are hoping to go into IR. Um, and if you could talk about international relations and international development um, specifically, that'd be great. Hmm. Advice that I would give to IR people. That's difficult because I'm going to be, I'm going to play realist with you because I think a lot of entry level foreign policy IR jobs are not exclusively dealt with IR. Like you're not right. talking strategy US visa vis China on day right. one of your job. <laughs> I hope not, honestly. Uh, <laughs> I would say this, I would say them, show them you can do anything. Show mm -hmm. them you can talk theory. Show them that you can um, accommodate a visitor at your organization, whether that person walked into the wrong building, is the custodian, or is right. the president, but is wearing informal attire and you don't know. And tell them you can you know, treat them with the same level of respect. Mm -hmm. Show them that you can read the room, and then right. you'll start being invited um, to work on projects or maybe things that you think are more substantive or speak to your degree. At the end mm -hmm. of the day, you have, still have to show them you're a person. And I think with right. the IR political space, it's very easy, at least at an undergrad, I thought somehow they're gonna test my knowledge of the security <laughs> dilemma and ask me for three examples. And it's No, that's not true. Like, yes, right. I want that and, and right. show them that you have grades. So I would say, don't forget the people skills. Right. Um, do what you can to not just show them, but embody that and tell them. And I think you'll get really far in this field because at the end right. of the day, IR is relation. It is relationship. Right. So right. embody it. Um, as for international development, I would say the same thing. I would say mm -hmm. keep trying. I understand yeah. there's a limited number of jobs. Keep trying and know that even the average person can reach their dreams. Again, might take a few tries. You can do it. The world still needs your help. Um, mm -hmm. And you can make a mark on the world in ways maybe you didn't imagine. So if you end up in the part of development that you didn't think that you would end up in, go exploring. Go wander. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Right. It's fine. You'll find your way back. The mm -hmm. other part of international development will always be here. Right. Right. And you've done that literally and figuratively gone exploring. I think that's another thing that's notable about your career and your life that I know, because I'm your friend, um, that you've you've been around the world. And that's obviously a big part of your work and your role. So I think that I see that that's what makes you good at it, is that you've seen different parts of the world. Notably, men studied abroad junior year of high school, which is not something that you do when you live in Wisconsin. I was saying this to Sid earlier today. Um, I was like, you just went where? <laughs> <laughs> I went to the Gulf. That? that is not common. I went to Oman um, on a government oh. scholarship. Oh. So I we think people were, were like, where July. did you? <laughs> no, go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. I said, I think people... Yeah, they were like, you went where in the Gulf? And I said, Oman. They were, they were a little confused. Um, right. But, you know, something that brings me, I had a delayed thought um, to anyone that's an aspiring development person or humanitarian person or just mm -hmm. you're interested in improving the world or being a better person. I think at a certain point, until recently I learned this, I approached development as, um, freedom from want and freedom mm -hmm. from fear. So it was a lot about tangible giving, mm -hmm. providing. And then um, I read in a book called We Crossed a Bridge and Then It Trembled. It's Voices from Syria. So those that, um, in the entire, the entire arc of the Syrian story and it's divided in that part. So there's a part where it's towards the latter and they're talking about voices that made it to their country of destination or maybe somewhere that they didn't intend. And this woman who is a refugee 
arrived somewhere at a, I think she's at a broadcasting agency and they're going to interview her. And the broadcaster says, it's okay. You're safe. You're in X country. Things are going to be okay here. You're safe. And the woman looks at her and says, I'm not afraid of death. That's not why I left. I want dignity. I'm afraid of not having my dignity. Right. Now, if you look at the world and ask who doesn't have dignity, and dignity is hard to define one, it's personal, it's in the eyes of the beholder, but that changes your worldview. Now you're not just obsessed with like, they have, you know, X, Y, Z person has to be in a safe place and they have to have this and have to have that. There, it's dignity that people want more than anything. And if you've ever been super embarrassed, like maybe that's a small moment where your dignity goes away. Like how much does that like, oh, that like is a bit of a poke to your side. I think that changed the way as to how I interact with people. Um, and it's made me more humble in thinking that I know what XYZ population in X country wants. Maybe I don't. Maybe I have to go talk to people and maybe it's nothing that I could have imagined. So mm-hmm. I think that anyone who wants to do development aid, um, keep that in mind. I have to interrupt our regularly scheduled programming to share that my housemate just delivered garlic bread to me. <laughs> he came in and said, garlic bread, and handed this to me. And I love her so much. Sneaky roommate. Yeah. She's the best. Um, that was great advice, man. Thank you so much. So do you want to take the next one? Yeah. Um, I would like us to pivot to one of the questions uh, our audience had. So I'm just going to bring that message up on the screen. So the question states, are there any popular misconceptions about international development or humanitarian aid that you wish were more widely understood to be false? Hmm. I feel like this is a hard question. (laughs) That's a hard question. Okay. Sure. <laughs> I love I love Got the it. challenge. I will say this. There are certain camps that believe, I will say this in the not PC way, but that development is another form of colonization. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to go into that. I would say several <laughs> things. Everyone has a right to their opinion. Several, several things. One, um, all international aid is not the same because all aid has conditions. What are conditions formed by? A lot of things. Sometimes it's foreign policy. Sometimes it's the donor and how they work. Sometimes it's the agency. It's not the same. So if you are really disturbed by one aspect of aid um, or you don't agree with it, I promise you there is a form of aid that you will agree with. And I promise you giving aid is better than restraining it. Now there is an argument to be made as to whether development is um, giving a man a fish or teaching a man how to fish. And I will say right. there is an issue with that, I understand, is that the hand that feeds or that gives is always the hand that's above the person. So there right. is power. I'm not saying ignore power. You should never ignore power. I'm saying if you want to reimagine now the fishing landscape, an equal partner with quote unquote beneficiary, which is a high power dynamic, as equal partners, then do that. Work towards the aid that you envision and not the ones you have issues with. Research, find a way to still do good in a different system, or if you don't like it, remake it. The aid, the aid environment has changed. You can change mm-hmm. it again if that's what you really want. That was great. Thanks so much for the question from the audience and thanks for the response, man. Um, we appreciate it. I think up next is the fun part of this interview. So Ali, I'm gonna let you go ahead and kick us off with that. Okay. So every session we do something called the rapid fire. When I was interviewed, I said it was my least favorite part because I knew what was coming. Um, but this will be fun, promise. Um, so my first question for you is what is your favorite city in the world? Chef Shaw in Morocco. If you ask how to spell it, it's C-H-E-F. Oh boy. C-H-E-F-C-H-A-O-U-E-N. 
maybe there's an E at the end in some spellings, but it's um, a blue city, blue mountain city in Morocco. Right. You might see it as green savers. Yeah. Um, and it's beautiful. I, I remember I when you went there because I saw I it on your Instagram. <laughs> 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 yes, <laughs> favorite city. All right, next question, uh, cheese or wine? Wine. I'm sorry, Wisconsinites, I'm really <laughs> sorry. I I don't know if I would say the same, but I did, that was an intentional question I wanted to know, which- <laughs> Been converted huge. with the Parisians and the time- I mean, I yeah, you're, you know. you're moving to France, so <laughs> I guess you're allowed, but they have cheese there too. Yeah, yeah. I don't know, ask me tomorrow. I probably <laughs> okay. change my mind. I will, I will. All right, Ali, you're up next. Oh, I'm next? Um, book you read most recently? Oh, um, I think it's called On the Ground or From the Ground. It's a story of um, women from North Africa or the Levant, commonly referred to the Middle East and Africa, that also report on that region. Mm -hmm. um, and either they're from there or they're diaspora women. It, they're telling what it's like to, you know, live their life and report wow. from there. Um, it's very, it's very eye opening, definitely. So highly recommend it. Leave it to you to have read most recently a book that's relevant to your career. <laughs> I just have to say the. The upstanding citizen here at Careers Uncorked. I mean, I also spent a good amount of time on, I don't know, BuzzFeed today. So That's if right. you want to know if right. even that. Good. Balance, balance, balance. It's important. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So last question. Who is your favorite co-host, Ali or Sid? <laughs> I plead the fifth. And that's how I'm gonna <laughs> that's end what I said. <laughs> oh my god! It's okay, yes. then you know the answer. <laughs> I do. I'm screaming it with my eyes. So I'll <laughs> okay, you with that one. <laughs> good, good. That's a good answer. Good job. You All get right. us the gold star for that. Yep. We'll, we'll sell. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Uh, that wraps up the, the rapid fire, and I think it's uh, about time. We've spent 47 minutes with you. Thanks so much, Min, for being here. Um, yeah, thank you. The curtains. This is, uh, once again, thanks so much for being here. Like always, anyone who's still watching, make sure to follow Min on LinkedIn. We've uh, left her LinkedIn URL down below. And as always, you can go check out our website. We'll have a recorded version of this live stream. And thanks so much, Min. You've shared so much knowledge here today. I mean, I was yeah. honestly uh, very, very excited to be part of this session. And then just hearing your thoughts on all of this, it's uh, it's very, very uh, exciting. Uh, Ali, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you're just dropping knowledge bombs. As <laughs> I knew you would, as I knew you would. Um, things that really stuck out to me were learning, always learning. Um, and people skills. I feel like it, now it seems obvious to me, international relations, as you explained it, relations, relationships, but um, that seems to be really the core of IR. And you you seem to have cracked it. I can say that is not in the IR field, um, that you, you've really forged a path for yourself. And I'm bursting with pride over here, um, <laughs> as you know, as you know. Um, but thanks so much for coming. I really, I really am so just glad to have you here and hear everything that you have to say. Yeah. Thanks again. And yeah, Ali is going to be celebrating with the garlic bread. Um, I um, will. Yeah. <laughs> but Min, any closing for the audience? Well, well, first, Sid, Ali, thank you for having me. To the rest, you can do it. Again, the average person can reach their dreams. Be patient with yourself and with the world. The world is filled with people just trying to do their best like you and your time is going to come around i promise so keep going you'll do great all right thanks so much min thanks for spending the evening with us and for anyone still on we'll catch you next time all right hey you yeah you we want you to join our community you do join us by hitting that subscribe button to stay up to date with all the awesome content we have in store for you oh yeah and one more thing 
make sure to smash that like button. No way, actually, destroy it. We're millennials, we love seeing likes. Catch you next time. Whoop out!